Um, this is a uh, part of the Dublin Food Cooperative's uh, community development program, and this uh, edition is actually we're very excited to have Sean McCabe joining us from Task. Um, I'll just give him a brief introduction, um, and then I think Sean is going to give us um, a, a short presentation. Uh, based on this report that he's here to discuss tonight. But Sean is, uh, briefly, he's the Executive Manager of TASC's Climate Justice Centre, and it works on uh, a variety of different research themes, including the just transition, sustainable development, and people-centred climate action. Um, and he's also the author of The People's Transition, uh, the Community-Led Development for Climate Justice Report, uh, which came out last year, I think, Sean, isn't that right, with, with TASC? And um, it's certainly been creating waves and it's been getting a lot of notes and uh, a lot of uh, advertisements. So it's, uh, and it's been widely discussed by many different people. Maybe Sean will tell you a little bit about that. Um, but I guess the way we'll structure this conversation is Sean's going to give us a short presentation. Uh, and then as it's going through, if you, would, if you think of any questions, if you wouldn't mind typing them in the chat and I'll make sure I get to them and hopefully we'll have a nice kind of very democratic, non-hierarchical conversation. Um, so, okay, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Sean. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Um, there's a nice um, sort of uh, cyclical uh, element to this conversation because it was a, co a coffee with Patrick about three years ago that would have had quite an influence on, on the report itself. So it's really nice to be sharing the, sharing the virtual stage. Uh, with him tonight. Um, I'm going to, oh, Kevin, you might let me share my screen if you can. Uh, I've just slides so that you don't have to spend your time looking at me while I'm talking about the report. Um, and just to say, uh, it might look like there's a lot, but we'll fly through them quickly enough. Um, so um, can everyone see that? The People's Transition um, was a report funded by uh, the Foundation for Progressive Studies, uh, for European Progressive Studies, FEPS, um, and which we conducted at TASC, the Think Tank for Action on Social Change, based in Dublin. Um, and, and it really set out to ask the question about how do we um, realise meaningful climate action in Ireland, and particularly in, in, in rural Ireland, uh, in communities very heavily dependent on agriculture. Um, and I guess it evolved over the time from being a very specific lens looking at agriculture to quite a wide um, society-wide report uh, transition report, how to enable that through participation and, and, and local development. And um, that is like it, it completely down to conversations like the one I mentioned with Patrick and, and literally um, maybe 150 other people around the country there's great knowledge in our communities and, and, and I'm very much aware that tonight when I'm talking to you, um, some of you are, are far more expert in, in these areas than I am. So I'll try to get quickly through this and we can get to the conversation. Um, so just three points. What is the, like, the people's transition? Why do we need it? What is it? And uh, how does it work? So why do we need it? We're all familiar with the reason why. Forgive me if you've seen this presentation before i'll try to go through it as quickly as possible and um, as patrick said the report's out a year so there's maybe people who have seen it we know that we have uh, very little time to radically transform our emissions profile to reduce our emissions to zero not net zero and to um uh, really ensure that all people not just in ireland but around the world can take part in this transition so that we don't um leave people behind uh, because um, there's a real risk with leaving people behind, whether that's um, true hikes in, in carbon tax or, or um, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the human rights abuses and the creation of, of renewable energy, such as batteries or, or renewable plantations, uh, dispossessing people of their land. All of, all of this poorly planned, rushed uh, climate action will spark resistance, and we don't have time for resistance, essentially. If we want this to be fast and effective, we need to include people, and we can't be uh, making life harder for people. 
And, and, and also this idea of perception being nine tenths of the natural law, it, it kind of drives me a little, it's, it's a real issue of mine that we spend an awful lot of time in, in um, maybe what you might call uh, the liberal media, um, talking about how farming, for example, has to come to an end. And then we are surprised when there's massive resistance from farming communities or when bad faith actors can manipulate those sort of headlines into um, uh, really, you know, to spur uh, opposition to climate action. And then this is a, a really critical element uh, in my eyes, uh, trust. Um, we have to have trust in our decision-making models in order to ensure that we can accept the changes that are necessary. We saw with the pandemic how quickly uh, really strict measures to, for, the, for, for public health led to significant um, opposition, uh, not just here, but across the world. And so if we're going to have long sustained enduring climate action, we have to ensure that it proactively builds trust. We can't expect that trust to just, per, um, you know, we currently we don't have great levels of trust in national decision makers or even local decision makers, but we can't expect that trust to maintain true an emergency unless we are intentionally trying to build it and, and, and represent people fairly and, um, I suppose, effectively. And then, then the second major point about why we, why we need uh, a people's transition is, is this question of um, what neoliberal economics has done to our world. Um, we've seen a, a drastic um, increase in inequality uh, between the top 10% and the bottom 50%. We're all familiar with the Oxfam reports. This is, this is global, it's in Europe, and it's, it's also in Ireland. Um, and so we need to ensure that community is respected and, and, and that, that people's sense of place and people's sense of uh, um, agency, or people's not sense of agency, but their agency is, is well respected within the transition. Um, this paper by Aiken and all is, is, is worth a read about um, climate change and community in neoliberal context, but they, they, they cite two key points um, which pose a big challenge for the implementation of climate action. It, they call it rollback and rollout. So the, the rollback or the withdrawal of state provisions and formal supports and the rollout of market-based approaches and focuses on neoliberalism. That's a, that's a big problem. Uh, for inspiring community-led climate action. Um, and why is it a problem? Well, it relies on two things. First of all, it relies on individualism or hyper-individualism, which, you know, it, it's a bit much to expect patterns of consumption to get us out of a crisis caused by excess consumption. It's, we, we're, we're past that now. We need to think differently. And, and individualism promotes that idea of consumption. And then there's also competition, like it introduces an instrumentalization of communities, it introduces like a situation where communities are competing for very scarce resources in order to conduct uh, projects for the public good. And um, that's not a good situation. We shouldn't be dividing communities like that. Um, and then fundamentally, it comes down to this, and, and we actually have a paper coming out next month on perceptions of climate action in Ireland based on a Red Sea poll that we ran in July. And it, it backs up this assertion that underpinned the, the People's Transition Report. And that's that people care more about local development than they do about climate action. Uh, and, and that will always be the case. People have immediate priorities, and it's very hard to understand or engage with situations that are distant in time or distant in, 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 in space um, when, you know, when you're struggling to get your kids through school or to, to um, pay for school books or to heat your home. So the idea behind the people's transition is this virtuous uh, cycle of climate action that communities are engaged as an implementing partner, first and foremost, that's key, participation. And then the climate action is seen by the community to address local needs and priorities. That's because it values local knowledge and communities' capabilities as a result are expanded. Their trust in decision-making is enhanced. And then demand is increased because through co-creation and co-ownership, we see uh, 
lives getting better, community wealth being built, and and a real um, uh, you know race to the top, if you will. So what's the people's transition? Well, really quickly, it came out of a, a, a lot of things, like I say, many conversations with people who are doing incredible things all over the country, dedicating their lives to really, um, you know, better, for the betterment of us all, I guess. Um, and those conversations, you know, when thinking about a just transition for communities in rural Ireland, well, it, it brought about this, uh, um, these four points, I would say, and they're important to read. I'll just read them really quickly. There, there is no opposition to climate action, even among farmers. There's just an opposition to lives being made more difficult. That's a very important point to note. Like people aren't against climate action just for the sake of it. Prioritizing a legislative environment that favors large business models has the potential to detrimentally impact on the well-being of communities. Extractive models like we see in the current agricultural model, for example, uh, extract produce time and creativity and return very little to the community. Um, to enable a just transition, a legislative environment is required uh, that seeks to create conditions for well-being um, and local socioeconomic and positive local socioeconomic and environmental outcomes. Um, and to achieve this, a capabilities lens is required. That's the Marta Sen's capabilities report, um, coupled with a whole of society approach um, that appreciates um, how, how supply and labor chains for climate action can be harnessed to build community and build local wealth. Um, so the proposal is for a participant model uh, of climate action in the EU that prioritizes local development and community ownership and aims to build proactively build public support on that question of trust that we discussed earlier. Um, I'll kind of race through this because I'm, I've been talking for a while, uh, but I don't know how many of you have read Marta Sen's development as freedom, but um, the capabilities approach basically says that, and this is how I envisage the broader just transition. I think it's important that we maintain the term just transition for the workers um, whose li livelihoods are being, um, I suppose, um, you know, we, we don't want stranded workers on the back of climate action or on the back of the shutting down of fossil fuel um, sectors, et cetera. So, and, and, and the term just transition has a very significant um, home in, in that struggle. So I think a capabilities approach and, and the idea behind the people's transition is, is the idea that, well, if we can just use climate action to expand capabilities, then we'll be doing something of significance. And um, that means... Um, uh, giving people the freedom to achieve well-being as a primary moral imperative. And then ensuring that that freedom to achieve well-being is understood in terms of people's capabilities, or put another way, real opportunities to do and be what they want and value. Uh, and that, that, that's, um, that's critical. We, we, can't, we can't expect people to we can't just say you have another job move to that other job it has to be we have to respect that people have a sense of place they have a sense of belonging and that sense of place and belonging is is critical to their identity and 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 um, how we structure the future uh, really quickly um, it, this is climate justice it it is about supporting the right to development it is about sharing the benefits and burdens of climate action equitably and fairly and it is about ensuring that decisions are participative transparent and accountable. So this is, this is kind of what the people's transition is. It's, it's, it's at the very foundation, it, it's evening out inequity or in access to decision-making with, with a capabilities lens. And then it's fostering trust, building local knowledge. And I think what people here today can really play a role in, especially those in the cooperative movement, building capacity for the types of solutions that can be based in community wealth building or community-led local development or community ownership Let's not silo them. They could all be happening at the same time. It's it's um, just needed to make a diagram, <laughs> and and uh, that will hopefully result in fast and fair climate action based on local development. I'm going to skip that slide because I've been talking too long. Skip that slide. How does it work? It works something like this. You can read this in the report, but basically it's about listening to, learning from, and co-creating with local communities building climate action that meets the needs and priorities of local communities. And it would look a little bit like this. Uh, we have Mary McManus on the call, who's probably far more capable than I am in, to, in terms of talking about community wealth building. But in terms of community wealth building in the, um, 
climate context, we have to envisage climate action as an anchor institution. An anchor institution is a community wealth builder. It's an it's, uh, element of public procurement that is influenceable, I guess. And, and if we can understand that every piece of climate action in this country has quite a broad supply chain, and that supply chain can be intentionally um, located or intentionally used as a, a lever for local development, um, we, can, we can spread out the new climate economy across the country and it can be a solidarity economy where we're looking at um, different parts of the country addressing uh, different elements of, of, of the climate action supply chain and really benefiting from the revenues that that creates. Um, and we can give a pretty concrete example uh, in, in our conversations later. So, so some questions that constantly come up on this is surely it'll be very significant in terms of cost of time and resources, that's a yes. And um, it'll be very messy and difficult to arrange participation. I can, having been working on two pilot projects for the last six months, absolutely say that's a yes. Um, but will it significantly delay climate action? I, I firmly believe that's, that's no. And, and the reason is that in order to be fast, climate action simply has to be fair. It has to equitably distribute the benefits and the burdens. Uh, and if it doesn't, we're going to come a cropper in terms of um, resistance, in terms of, of, of um, far-right uh, groups looking to harness the discontent to build their support. I don't know how many of you, I don't know where, I don't know where they get the money from, but this National Patriot newspaper nonsense that comes through your door, I, I got it today. Uh, I don't know if it's only a Dublin thing, but um, it's a serious publication. It's deterred that I've had through my door. And on the front page, along with um, all sorts of other um, populist nonsense was a um, uh, uh, a little article on how climate action is going to devastate rural Ireland. So if we are serious about neutralizing any shift to the far right, we have to start by distributing the benefits and burdens of climate action now. Uh, otherwise, we'll end up in a situation where it's too late. So that's it. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. I think that took way longer than I said it would. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, no, 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 I think uh, I could have listened to you go on. Actually, there is uh, lots there to unpack and um, I'm sure um, people here have lots of questions. So just to repeat, if you do have any, um, do stick them in the uh, the chat box or maybe raise your hand and I'll try and, and get to you. But actually just the first question, Sean, that I, I just wanted to ask you is in terms of, obviously you, you mentioned this came out in 2020 when it felt like the world has kind of been tipped upside down. So it came out during the, the COVID crisis I guess we're still in it but I mean did that affect how it kind of cut through I wonder and specifically I was wondering more about we were having debates or it felt like we we're having debates about what sort of worlds we want to come out of the, the pandemic and I just wondered whether this report was able to kind of tap into some of those discussions and maybe in a way it might be fortuitous that the, the report had such a, a context I suppose into which to emerge. I'd love I'd love to think that was true I, I don't know <laughs> I guess only time will tell. I, I, I think it has been reasonably well received and I think people have, uh, which is great. It's, it's, it's nice when, when that happens. I, I do think you're right. I think people are looking for ideas now and, and, and it's a time to be kind of throwing whatever ideas we have. Like I say, I, I, I came up with very little in this report. It was an amalgamation of ideas and thoughts from, from lots of people from all over the country. And um, what I would say is that and I think this is probably everyone finds this to be the case. It's become a lot easier to talk about what would have previously been considered radical ideas in the wake of the pandemic, because I think we've seen that actually the system we were living in wasn't as bulletproof as we thought it was. Now, anyone who had spent any time in an impoverished country or, or um, you know, considering at any length the climate and environmental crises we face would have known that obviously but i think there was many people going around thinking that life was very normal and that what we were doing and how we were doing it was all all made sense and the pandemic 
kind of jolted that. So hopefully it created a space for new ideas. The the vaccine inequality and other things would suggest otherwise, but um, mm. hopefully. And um, <clears throat> I kind of also want to like hone in on this element of trust that, that is really at the heart of the model. And one of the reasons I really like the report is that in terms of its methodology, it really is trying to um, do something quite different. It's quite different from maybe uh, uh, some of your more traditional policy reports. So I'm interested in this participatory method that you that that, that you used. Um, first off, I just wondered if you could say something about what the many conversations you actually had actually looked like. I mean, it, it, according to that map, you have all these uh, these dashes and arrows where different conversations happen. I mean, but it's simply kind of taking over a town hall, getting the parish together, and asking them a kind of a few sort of general questions or was there something was I mean what kind of preparation went into these conversations um very little preparation I think I I, I was basically in a camper van and I was driving into farmyards I, I didn't have town halls or anything I was mostly trying to get to farmers and fishermen and have conversations um at their breakfast table or at their dinner table and, and it, it was um I was just amazing. It was really a, a lovely thing to do, I think, in many ways, because um, th there was great hospitality. People really did want to talk. People are very, I think, th th these conversations happened before the pandemic. And, and even then, people were very worried about the systems. You know, a lot of, a lot of farmers, for example, were very aware that the cheap food systems that we have aren't exactly sustainable and and they knew that they were doing a lot more work than their fathers had done for less money purely because in order to um, kind of pay off the debts that they accrue in increasing their herds and building new parlors and new sheds and um, they were really limited in what, how they could hire help so most of the work was being taken on by the family. And, and then, um, you know, you had the fodder crisis that had come the year prior and, and, and that had caused so much stress and caused an increase. In, and, and so there had been this awareness of, God, if that happens again, or if that happened two years in a row, I don't know how we'd get through it. So there was that uh, awareness that, that, that our seasonality or our climate might be shifting a little bit. Um, and I, I think there was just genuinely uh, a desire for a way of life that wasn't so precarious um, in the most part. And uh, kind of it, it was made very clear, I think, to me through it, that it's, it's that first line. There, there was no opposition to climate action. There is an opposition to um, suspicions about what climate action might be. Uh, mm which is kind of driven by bad faith actors in this space. And then there is um, uh, like a real desire to, I think like we've all experienced in the last 10 years to have a system that's fairer and more equitable and, and, and which treats people with respect, I guess. Yeah, I, I think I think going back to a few years ago, I suppose it was during the time you were writing this report and researching it, this is, um, the, where the beef farmers were, were protesting in Dublin and you know there was a big mass mobilization it fell of farmers and it was quite it was quite a sight to see the tractors kind of rolling through around um, Marion Square and it was notable though from what I remember from those days is that the negotiations that were taking place involved farmers representatives and the um, the government themselves but there was a, an absence of the other kind of key link within that supply chain, which is the supermarkets. And I just wonder, like, could you say a little bit about that kind of relationship between, well, I suppose relationship between the countryside and the, the urban set in towns and cities, but also what this, what this report really raises, I suppose, about our relationships between producers and consumers, because sometimes it feels in the, the rhetoric or the discourse, we are kind of pitted against each other and that farmers are presented as a, a sort of obstacle to, to progress. Um, but your, your report actually brings us somewhere else. So I just wanted if you could talk to that. It's funny, I, the, the, the beef farm protests were taking place while I was driving around and I tried to stop at a few of them and, and speak, but I wasn't like, I was, I think, viewed with suspicion, this lad in the camper van pulling up saying like, I come from Dublin and I wanted to. So um, I didn't get much out of those conversations, but I think the climate movement missed a big opportunity in that moment. 
if the climate movement had been ready and open-minded, there was a very real conversation to have with beef farmers about the future. Um, and instead, actually, um, I think we ceded ground to the other side um, a little bit in that moment. Um, in terms of in terms of the relationship between urban and rural, or like I just I think the main perpetrators of the issues we have are these large multiples and and the agri business model that stocks them. And yeah, we do get told like it's about eating less meat and it's about um, um, and 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 farmers are very often cast in a negative light. Um, I really don't think that's helpful at all to where we want to go. Um, and not all farmers, obviously, but like like big dairy farmers, big beef farmers are cast in this very negative light. Um, but really, if you see it as a, a, a system, you have a situation where there's extraction taking place on both sides. So obviously, people who shop in the big supermarkets that offer really cheap produce are oftentimes um, maybe working a couple of jobs or they're studying and working a job and they don't have a lot of, they don't have the luxury of time. Maybe they can only go shopping at nine or 10 at night. And so it's all that's open. Uh, oftentimes they're on minimum wage or they're in precarious work. And so they don't have luxury of buying more expensive organic produce. Um, and, and so they create a demand for very um, cheap produce. And on the other side of that equation, you have farmers being put under pressure to produce produce very cheaply, um, which they're doing and, and, and at some significant cost, I would say, to their mental health, among other things. Um, and in the middle, you have these you know, shareholders or whoever it is in, in, in a large multinational chains who are extracting everything. They're extracting all the labor of the farmers and they're extracting all of the um, efforts of the, of the consumers as well. And, and, and then the consumer is told, it's up to you to change your behaviors. So the farmers will change their behaviors. And that's a cod, you know, like it's, that's not what it is. It's, it's a, a system that pits and, uh, people against each other. So the report proposes, and I think Patrick and, and others here, you'd be much better positioned than me to kind of think through some of the solutions, anyone who's worked in, in, in uh, food co-op, how you scale uh, a system whereby the producer and the consumer are in partnership. Um, and obviously that requires legislation and it requires cultural changes and it requires all sorts of things. But that's where we have to go to. It has to be um, a, a more closed loop between the producer and the consumer where they view each other as allies in trying to sustain ourselves and feed ourselves in a way that's harmonious with, with the world. Yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting. I, I mean, again, reading the report, you, I mean, where, where, you're, where we're directed as you're reading it, and it's, it's a line I really agree with, is as soon as you start, I suppose, exposing these kind of, uh, these food systems that we're relying on, you, you, you draw us towards a, a political economy that relies, that needs and requires things like a living wage, um, that you know, the, the, it's not just a single action that's going to solve this crisis, and it kind of asks us to kind of, I suppose, propose a completely different model, uh, a completely different form of political economy. And I guess I, uh, someone who's an active member of the Dublin Food Co-op, and uh, I write a lot about cooperation and the history of it, and it's something I do think is a kind of a conundrum at the heart of the cooperative projects, which is a tension between that desire to be more participatory and uh, delivering a kind of a bottom-up driven, um, perhaps more anarchic, more democratic economy, um, for it to be, to be idealistic about it, but still requiring, I suppose, those kind of like big state levers. And maybe I'm speaking more to my own kind of particular situation than maybe other cooperators here who, um, who we are a broad church after all, who might have a slightly different read. Um, I think in terms of, and that there will be other people here who can speak more to this, I mean, in terms of what we do at Food, Dublin Food Cooperative to kind of like scale up um, what we do is we try and cultivate and it takes time, which I think is one of the other things that comes out of the report is we don't really have a lot of time to try and kind of build new local 
sustainable connections between producers and consumers. Uh, we're, we're closely linked in with the community garden and cherry orchards, for example. Uh, but it's something that, that, that is kind of at the forefront of what we do is the Dublin Food Court. But I mean, we do realize and recognize that we are existing in a, an economy and a food supply and distribution system where that is very much a minority pursuit at the moment. So I think there are questions there about how we can have that bottom up and that top down uh, model. And this is a long way, I suppose, of asking you about the kind of the, 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 the whole system of community wealth building. Um, you've mentioned it uh, there during your presentation. It comes through very, very clearly in the report. Um, but I just kind of would, if you could just give us a reading of where you think the politics, or maybe politics isn't the right word, but where community wealth building is out in Ireland at the moment. I mean, it's, the, the, there are international examples, but I'm just wondering whether you're seeing it beginning to coalesce here. Um, I, I think it's coming. Um, it's it's very it's it's we're a long way from it. Maybe and and genuinely, I know I've said it about three times, Mary, but it'd be nice to bring you in on this. Um, I, from my perspective, um, we've been working in two communities trying to implement a pilot project for the people's transition in Ardra and in Fibsborough. And I guess our model is about participation. It's about trying to get people to a point where we've identified their needs and priorities and of a community. And we've said, oh, look, this priority, this need and this need can all be addressed through this mechanism. If it's done cooperatively and if it has community wealth building components included within it. Um, and so, what we've discovered through that process is that it's very hard to understand how anything is being procured in this country. It's very hard to get detailed data that points to the contracts. Uh, so it's very hard to begin to suggest how it might change. And that's a problem. Now, Alice Mary Higgins did try to introduce a procurement bill. We, we have a very serious issue um, uh, because you know there's a belief that EU procurement laws are way stricter than they actually are. That's a problem in this country that we really think that EU procurement laws are ferocious and there's no way around them. Actually, there'd be a lot of wiggle room if we had the data and the political will to make it happen. But also um, there's a very useful procurement bill that um, Senator Higgins is bringing forward. She did already, and I think it's been pushed off for 12 months, but hopefully it'll come back before um, the doll again and it's on adjusting the parameters of what how you procure so that it's weighted 50% for price but then 50% for um, uh, quality and that quality can encapsulate many things including the working conditions where it's coming where the procurement is taking place etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, just to touch briefly on what community wealth building is, I guess I guess it was started um, it, it, as a concept in 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 Cincinnati and then in in, in Preston as a um, and Mary, please do feel free to jump in here as as a, um, a, a means to shift government procurement at the local level towards workers cooperatives and other institutions that would allow that wealth to stay within the communities rather than disappear through large multinational corporations or other similar uh, systems and, and, and it's been proven to work. Mary, do you want to come in a little bit and talk about the success of the model? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Mary McManus. I live up here in Belfast and um, I did some research on community wealth building as part of a master's um, last year and I promote the, con I promote the, uh, and advocate for community wealth building and do some research on it. And as um, Sean has said, I mean, one of the things, Preston's the most famous model, I guess, in the UK of um, community wealth building. And for me, the, the real success, I mean, not only did they relocalise um, about 270 million of spend that was leaking out of their local economy in Lancashire in about three years, they also, it, with COVID now, what has really shown the resilience of this model for me is the fact that at the end of December last year, their furlough rates 
was 6.9% when the average, the national average was about 13%. So because their local businesses were more, more um, dependent on their anchor institutions, like the big public sector institutions that are anchored in place and not going anywhere, it seems to have made their economy more resilient. And also, you know, that they were the most improved city in the UK in 2018, in, and they maintain, they've maintained that position. And this year they were voted the best city to live in in the Northwest of England. And then just to say with regard to community wealth building um, here in the North, um, we've had no local council actually formally adopted as a, a um, strategy for their economic development. Um, we did have um, the Department for Finance announced in the summer from installments that they are going to require 10% social, they're going to give 10% weighting to social value. And also they're going to ask that those people, those um, organizations or businesses who are tendering for their contracts um, pay real, the real living wage as well. So that's a bit of progress. And up here, we have a campaign for a mutual bank. Uh, it's called the Northern Mutual. And that is one of the, you know, one of the pillars of community wealth building is the, um, is the finance. And obviously with co-ops and small businesses, where are they going to get the finance without the state levers, for example, if they're not going to provide funding. And I know that um, Preston, Wirral and Liverpool Council are, they want to become more self-reliant and have their own access to finance to support their cooperatives. So anyway, we have a campaign for a mutual bank here. And obviously you would know Tiziana O'Hara who does the cooperative development up here. And it's, so some of us are looking at how can we do this? And it's a bit like what, you know, Sean, the people's transition. And, you know, what, what can we do in the absence? We can try and push and push at institutions and the state, but what can we do ourselves? You know, and for example, in the, the Centre for Local Economic Strategies, um, definition of an anchor institution, they include the combined power of the community and voluntary sector. So that's something I've been looking at and I'm working with, with the advice, I'm currently working with the advice sector where I used to work on presenting the advice sector as an anchor institution. Um, and through, you know, reframing that work through a, um, a community wealth building lens. So, I mean, there's nothing to stop for me, um, organizations clustering together and paying the real living wage, procuring locally, you know, to, to try and build the momentum as regards to community wealth building. And also Sinn Féin have released a community wealth building strategy in the South. And then, and that's, I think, how, you know, I heard about this and connected with Kevin on Twitter, is that Dublin City Council had a presentation on community wealth building um, just this, this week. Um, so, but, you know, people, they can, there can be talk and about community wealth building, there can be strategies, but whether or not it's actually a reality is another thing. That's really interesting. Thanks, Mary. I think you mentioned Kevin. Kevin's come in with a comment here. Do you want to ask that yourself, Kevin, or shall I read out for everyone? And then Marina as well. Uh, I guess... Um... Yeah, no, I guess um, what I was wondering were some of the, what are some of the institutional um, obstacles that, that, that we should be, Is this something we need to be pushing at the national level or I mean, or both? And uh, where do you see those opportunities? And, and just kind of with regards to uh, local democracy. Uh, yeah, I think are there Kevin people interested in, in a more empowered local government. Yeah, my, my camera's not great now. So I'm gonna... I think you're breaking up quite a bit, but. I... Yeah, but I think that I think one of the key points was that the 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 lack of local democracy in in Ireland in the well uh, in the south anyway seems to be a kind of a big impediment to kind of replicating the Preston model. Um, 
which I don't know how we get around that. I mean, that seems to be a problem that's left us by the Fianna Fáil decision in the late seventies to dismantle local government. Um, so that is a big institutional question. Um, uh, Marina, do you want to make your point about procurement? Because that's also something that's come up uh, quite a bit, I think. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not a particularly big point, but I think, as far as I remember, it is mentioned in the climate um, bill um, and also in the local authorities' climate charter. Procurement is definitely part of that. I don't know if that is also kind of goes towards Kevin's point about um, local authorities and, and what their role might be, because there's definitely also stipulations, I think, around kind of um, participation and um, local kind of representative structures and that kind of thing, but it's pretty weak from what I remember. So could, could I just say on that, I mean, in, in, in Preston, Preston Council um, doesn't have, you know, the, the um, huge um, powers that, that, you know, the larger councils have in England, that would be the Lancashire Council. and um, and. Um, how they did what they did was by, by being a leader. They don't, they, don't, they don't actually have their own very large procurement budget, but they led with the, you know, the other anchor institutions and they collaborated together. And that's where, you know, there was really, um, you know, a huge amount of where they could make a big impact because to, combined, there was a massive amount in procurement spend and, and, and how they employ. And for any, like, I mean, in Belfast, we have so many anchor institutions and if they were to get together and, you know, do what was done in Preston, it could have a huge impact at regards, you know, people's um, incomes and, you know, improving the social floor and improving, you know, the capabilities, Sean, that you were talking about, some of that, some of that, it would make a huge impact. So I wonder, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about your councils down south, but I wonder if they were a leader in their area and they you know, um, ask the other anchors to collaborate together. Would that would that not have a huge impact? Can I ask a question? Sorry on that. Just kind of to add to it rather, and because I'd be interested to hear you, Sean. Um, are we reliant then on those big institutions? Like, are we reliant on local councils? Are we reliant on anchor institutions, or are there ways around those? Like can, that, we could kind of do achieve the same. Um, goals. Maybe I'll answer that with my reference to the um, projects that we're running currently. So we've two very different communities. We've Ardra and Donegal, which has a serious uh, lack of anchor institutions. And that's where we kind of want climate action itself to be an anchor institution. Um, but in Dublin, uh, we're doing the project in Fibsborough, and there's like, when you look around, there's Mount Joy, there's the Botanic Gardens, there's the Matter Hospital, there's um, uh, Grange Gorman, there's quite quite a lot. Um, and, and as a first step, what we're going to try to suggest is that we're going to try to suggest the development of a retrofitting cooperative. And we're going to try to see if the advanced demand could be generated for for business for that cooperative could be generated by those anchor institutions because one of the challenges that you have in developing retrofitting cooperative is training people up and bringing them to the standard that's necessary in order to go out and start retrofitting people's homes but what these like it's not quite the procurement type anchor institution that mary's talking about but it could begin to bring people towards a culture of 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 community wealth building by saying, hey, we've got a small number of um, uh, like smaller buildings. We don't want, we obviously not going to go retrofit the matter hospital, but like there's a small number of, say, say they have a, a building that's an office and they'd be willing to let it be experimented on by the apprenticeship, by the apprentices who are coming through the retrofitting cooperative so they can cut their teeth before going out into the bigger world of, of you know, trying to deal trying to get real contracts um so so there's that um i don't know if that answers your question uh, marina but it, it's sort of like maybe we could circumvent a little bit waiting for the council by by as mary says being a little bit proactive in terms of pulling those anchor institutions together um that, that but but also we did get and and this is worth putting pressure on um work we we did get community wealth building into the local development plan 
So it's in there for Dublin. And I think that's why they had less over this week for a presentation to the council. And um, so I think it is worth kind of highlighting, flagging, putting pressure on and, and looking at those sort of, um, and, and linking it to climate action as well, because like you say, it is, there is procurement mentioned in the climate bill. And all, all this sort of stuff is, is coming from, I think, it, it, a, a sense that procurement's important, but without the understanding of why it's important. I, I spoke to um, someone in the Office for Government Procurement recently, well, it's probably a year and a half ago now, and they were talking about green procurement. And it's great, but it, it's them shipping their laptops overseas rather than flying them when they're ordering them. And, and so you're like, well, that's, yeah, that's helpful, but you know, it's not green procurement. You know, it's not what I would envisage as, as green procurement. So um, there's real steps that could be taken if culturally it became accepted at the political level. Um, I think just to continue on some of that, I think what's interesting in the, the Irish context and thinking about the co-op model and uh, its most successful iteration in the 20th century, has been the credit union model, um, which is, I mean, I've probably said this before to, to some people who are here, but it feels to me like the sleeping giant in terms of everything is set up, ready to go. You have an organization that's built around a common bond that's place-based, it's local, it's democratic. Um, it has in its constitution, the fact that it has to be social, socially valuable. Um, yet there is a real problem, uh, which, has been brought up by quite a few people in the credit union sector, which is that it, it's, legisl it's regulated out of being able to perform a lot of that, the work that it could do, I suppose. I mean, there, is, there are lots of, there's lots of money on hand in the credit union movement. Um, and it's kind of releasing it and making it, I mean, Ireland probably could leapfrog the step that Preston have had to go through, that they probably need to create that kind of neutral bank if they could direct local resources that belong to people because it's money that people themselves have lodged in their communities to actually do something valuable and i just wondered anyway whether that kind of uh, cooperative finance or the credit unions had come up in your local discussions conversations as um something that was locally important something that could actually help provide a, a pathway to this uh, people's transition i think they certainly inspired uh, it i like it did come up i think you know i loved what um the president said about uh, the opening of a credit union in Kerry uh, during the week. That was fantastic. But um, um, I think uh, what wasn't there an instance recently, and others will know more than me about this, but where the credit unions offered to invest heavily in, in public housing and, and that offer was, was turned down. Um, like, I, I, I feel like um, it would be a no brainer for credit unions to become the like community financing heartbeat of 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 climate action in Ireland, community led climate action in Ireland. It's it's an absolute no brainer. But like you say, there just there seems to be it's a combination of political will and maybe just a cultural shift. Um, I th I think how we look at how we also you know, I think we might have missed the opportunity, but for a while. Um, I was talking about um, community-led local development multi-fund approach from the EU, which, um, for those who don't know, uh, an extension of the LEADER program. Um, LEADER, which is a, a, a pretty much a model of the people's transition that already exists and is used to varying degrees of success across Europe and Ireland at one point, was the best in Europe at doing it. And, and actually, because it began to encroach so much on, I, I think, because it began to encroach so much on politics and, and you know, it's hard to sell yourself as the person who'll fix the pothole if the community can fix the pothole for themselves. So it, it became a little bit diminished leader in Ireland. Um, and then the EU brought out the community-led local development multi-fund approach, which went beyond leader and meant that every fund, every structural fund that comes into Ireland, including now the Just Transition Fund, Part of that could be siphoned off and handed directly over to communities to conduct um, local development actions. And there's some in, in Lisbon, there's some councillors using it to build community led housing. It's phenomenal, you know, uh, European funded community led housing. It's, it's such a fantastic initiative. It's called Eco Boa Vista. It's worth checking out. 
But here in Ireland, we've decided not to opt into that approach. And I think that speaks to a distrust in handing over power and resources to the community to allow the community to deliver for itself. Um, and, and, and it seems like we've opted, uh, I've no indication that we're going to opt in to it for this funding cycle, which means we won't be able to opt in until 2028. So that'll be 14 years of this approach being in existence where we haven't taken it up. So in terms of like the credit union or other instruments that might enable us to rapidly accelerate community-led climate action, I think we need a massive cultural shift. And I think it comes back to empowering local government and, you know, which is in the Green Party's sort of manifesto. So you'd, you'd hope that pressure on that could, could result in, in change. Um, but it should be in any, it should be in any party who, and, and Mary's right, like Sinn Féin have committed to uh, community led uh, or to community wealth building in, in, in themselves. And, and I know there's some uh, Sinn Féin work in, in Wicklow around community wealth building, which is interesting, but it's, it's a massive cultural shift, I think. And, and, and we are still in a country that sort of infantilizes, I think, the population rather than trusting them to do what's necessary. Mm, I, I don't know, I've got a question on that cultural shift, but I do before I ask it. Are there any questions that that might be coming from the floor? Just I'm looking at the clock and it is five to eight. So it'd be great to hear a, a few of the voices that we've not heard from yet, rather than me prattling on. Um, so if there are any other questions, it'd be good to maybe raise your hand now. Otherwise, I'll probably ask this question, which I'm which might be slightly indulgent, but as soon as you brought up that question of um, of culture. You know, with last week, two weeks ago, uh, there's quite a few people here from our, our reading group that we do called, um, uh, we're called, we called ourselves the organic intellectuals, but we meet weekly and we discuss different readings. And in fact, we're reading a report this week. Um, but last week we were discussing one of the other big stories that had cropped up, and maybe it's two weeks ago, time is kind of collapsing for me, but it's, um, you know, the housing for all report. And uh, I know having from having conversations with people in the co-op movement that uh, during that feeding procedure, there were quite a few kind of people who were putting in um, submissions to that process from the cooperative housing sector, you know, showcasing the fact that the co-op housing model is um, fit for purpose and indeed is actually something that could be incredibly useful and valuable to help us out of the climate crisis. And uh, one thing that came at uh, the housing crisis and the climate crisis, of course, are connected, but um, one of the things that came up then, I, I've, I've often harnessed this, the belief that you know, the cooperative options seem so low in priorities when it comes to policymakers. And I've kind of tended to give them the benefit of the doubt that if we can just kind of cut through and, you know, make our case fervently and show how valuable we are to, to, to society, that then policymakers will wake up and go, ah, okay, actually the co-op model is something that's really useful and isn't just a nice add-on or a, an old creamery that exists in our rural communities. Um, but things like the housing report do suggest that there's a kind of ideological need to sidestep uh, democratic measures to kind of help our way out of this crisis, this these many crises. And I just wondered uh, kind of what your take on that is really. That's a, another big question. And if anyone does have any other questions, please, uh, you know, do throw them in. I, I think that's completely it, Patrick. I think we have massive ideological barriers to overcome in the country. Uh, one thing that points very clearly to, and I, not many people are aware of this, but um, the uh, Citizens Information Board under the last government, um, it's always been an independent board, an independent organisation, and under the last government that independence was removed, and now in order to get on the board you have to apply through the Department of Social Protection. Um, and that um, was done against the wishes of the Dole, which is a remarkable thing. Um, so the motion to or the, the, the motion to consolidate and, and, and remove the independence of the Citizens Information Board was voted down and um, uh, it still went ahead. So I, I, I you know if you think about the Our House Convention, if you think about how important access to information is for any of these things that we're talking about, if you're thinking about that uh, you know like we need independent advice, that's that's very concerning. If you look at how freedom of information is treated in this country, that's very concerning. Um, like we're, you know, we need 
a sea change, I think, in if we're to survive in um, uh, transparency and openness and, and, and genuine systems of democracy. And, and, and so we're tinkering about the edges. I think some of us, and we're, 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 you're dealing with a system that's geared to uh, mitigate against systems of cooperativism or, or, or systems of, of community-led climate action. And, and so it's very hard to exist in that, can, in that state. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's all ideological. I think, I, you know, when you look at the government coming out and saying we might, we might push back against the OECD's uh, corporate tax harmonization, we're an outlier globally, right? Like if that's if we're taking that approach, we're in big trouble, you know. And um, so, yeah, I think ideology has everything to do with it, and maybe it is just a grassroots movement that uh, ultimately topples that ideology. But I, I think that's where organizing and, and and stuff I'm not great at, but like you know, there's so many good people out there to really push out the boat in terms of them. Um, driving change from the bottom up. And I suppose that's one of the uh, remits of this community development program. Um, now, I, I do see we're coming up to eight o'clock, but a couple of questions have come in. So if you don't mind just maybe taking them, Sean, that would be great. Cool. Um, uh, Catherine McCabe, you, you might have to enlighten me because I, I my mind isn't fully functioning, but wondering if you see PPNs as having any role, if you'd just like to maybe expand on what a PPN is. Uh, yeah, Catherine might want to come in, but it's the public participation networks, I guess, and um, how they could be utilized for, for this, actually. Um, for the people's transition. I, I think I think they're they're central to it. Um, but I think that you know there's some incredible PPNs around the country and 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 people putting huge amounts of time and effort into them. Um, and uh, you know, I just wish they're voice was more clearly heard like it, it, their their um their decisions were acted upon as a matter of course um where i don't think that's the case i don't think there's the legislative space for ppns to always meaningfully affect decision making it's it's a good it's it, they're, they're great institutions uh, to have uh, and it's incredible the amount of volunteer time that people put in but we really need to see these things become a cornerstone of decision making rather than, you know, it's a little bit like um, I've had some conversations with a number of people about the submission processes that exist in this country where, you know, we saw it with the climate bill, particularly or not the climate bill, but the climate action plan, people spending, you know, it must be thousands and upon thousands of hours across the whole country given by individuals sitting down at their at home writing their ideas down and sending them off to as a submission to the climate action plan and you have to wonder like is that is that a sensible process like would would we not be better convene meetings and have conversations and you know claire ppn did some brilliant work around around um supporting the community and making these submissions but what happens to them how do they genuinely influence the outcome of the climate action plan uh, do they genuinely influence it? And if they don't, then why are we spending so much time uh, writing? Like, is it, you know, there has to be a better way to engage public participation in, 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 in and, and, and so I think the public participation networks are incredible. I think the people involved in them are incredible, but I think we really need to question what, how their impacts can be improved and how more people can get involved. Yeah, of course, because if, if people keep making these submissions and feel they're going nowhere, then it's got to lead to disengagement ultimately, I assume. And that's how I would feel if I was repeatedly engaging well, with a process that seemed to go nowhere. One thing we're finding in the two communities where we're trying to run these projects is this massive consultation fatigue where people are just like, why would we bother? Like we've been asked so many times, nothing has changed in 15 years, but we've, made like hundreds of submissions in that time so that's something that we have to get really real about um, and real, real participation. sorry i talked over there kevin sorry no no 
know, just uh, so I, I jumped in. <laughs> yeah, just just like meaningful participation where, where where people's voices actually count. You know that uh, that they they listen to and and that they 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 go towards having a, an impact. You know, uh, taken seriously. Yeah. Marina, you have a point there as well that relates to, I guess, cultural change that's needed. Well, yeah, I was uh, there was a section in the report on education and capacity building, and I was just kind of so often that um, falls back on kind of it'll do the awareness piece around terminology, you know, just transition, climate justice and so on. And then when it comes to the action part, so often you'll see it just falls back on that neoliberal approach of kind of individual consumption um rather than maybe more um uh i don't know we want to call them communitarian or like collective approaches and how those could be because i think often the individual side of it feels much more tangible you know um to people like well i have stopped um, buying things in plastic so I feel better about it whereas other things because they take longer to build maybe um, you can't you don't see the effects as quickly or you don't feel like you're doing something as as impactful and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on kind of how do we um, avoid that pitfall um, yeah maybe other people do I'm not I'm not I, I, I would have some sense that we're fighting a really tough battle because if you think about you know, even recent reports about, you know, what went into creating the story of the carbon footprint and, um, you know, how these have all been tools to allow fossil fuel companies to continue producing and pushing so much responsibility. Like, it's it's almost like psyops or something, right? Like, it's a, it's a really serious uh, challenge to, to push back against how ingrained that individual responsibility concept has become. But I think it can only be, and this I sort of mentioned it to you, Patrick, before we started this conversation. Like I think we need the capacity building to be being done by the cooperatives, by people who've already are are striving to build mm -hmm. these models, and you know there there needs to be space created, whether it's the local development companies create and uh, or enable. Uh, cooperative learning for even their employees but like we need to mainstream the concept through those systems of local development and that's the capacity building that's needed to you know um S susie uh, can who i'm sure many of you know who works with me in task on on, on the pilot projects has a great example of fintry in scotland where um uh, basically the community was told there was a wind farm going in beside them and they said absolutely not and then the wind farm company came back and said well we'll give you two thousand dollars or two thousand pounds each and they said geez well if you can afford to do that what are these wind farms worth and they did some digging and they were like oh no we, we want one of your wind turbines we don't want any of your money we want one of the wind turbines and when the debt on that is paid they're currently making about 50 60 thousand a year into the community and when the debt is paid off which is the next year or so on the turbine they'll be getting 500,000 a year into the community. And like, once you say, tell that story to a community, when you tell that story to the community in Ardra, they go, all right, yeah, we know what we could do with 500,000 a year. You know, we could actually do some pretty incredible things with that. And uh, we could have our own bus service that we run. So like, um, I think we have to get that message out to communities that cooperative approaches, that's the capacity building that's needed. I think, um, that's the only way that you move away from the individual and understand that actually there's benefits to cooperation. Yeah, not to be too utopian about it, it reminds me of uh, the great Irish cooperator, William Thompson, who devoted his life to try and overturn the competitive system, which he saw as damaging in so many different ways. Um, and we, I guess we, 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 we work here at Dublin Food Co-op and other co-ops to try and you know, showcase how the cooperative system can actually work, not just as a utopian idea, but in practice too. Um, I do see one final question and if you, and then we'll wrap it up because I realise we've kind of gone way over. So I'm, I'm sorry, Kevin, if I've kind of spoiled the, the plans for the recording, but I just see uh, probably got touching back on one of our previous uh, conversations, Dan McInerney's asked, do you see merit in the citizens assembly model? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it's a very, very interesting model. Um, 
I always think it's a little bit perverse that you have to have a citizens assembly when you have uh, elected representatives, right? That's kind of what they should be. But um, clearly there is a need for it. And, and I think a lot of good can come from, from that considered. But I'd love to see it localized. And there is like there is ways to localize it. And the people's transition, the, the listening phase, if it hadn't been for the pandemic, we would have tried to have um, mini republics uh, or many publics or whatever it's called, uh, at, at various points around the country to um, uh, bring ideas together and, and, and help um, build capacity and, and understanding about what we're trying to do. But yeah, I think, I think there is merit, um, but other people would have better ideas on that than me. I also notice, and it's very worth giving a shout out to the uh, Open Food Network, which is, um, I think, a, a huge tool in what we're all trying to do. I agree. And uh, again, another old Irish cooperator, George Russell, once described cooperatives as economic republics, which I think is um, very much what we're trying to achieve as well. Um, OK, I think we'll probably draw it to a close there. So